Hello, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. We appreciate the city of St. Petersburg for sponsoring this program, curated by Helen Pruitt Wallace, the Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg. Uh, we're really happy today to have two great poets, Michael Torres and Sara Borges, Borjas, perdón. Uh, and uh, they will be introduced, of course, by Helen, and is, as is our tradition in this series, um, Helen will first read a poem of her own. And I'm looking forward to hearing the three poets in succession today. So thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Hank, and welcome, um, welcome to all of you um, who are tuning in this evening for what I think will be a really great um, couple of readings. I'm so excited to have Michael and Sarah here, and um, there are many reasons why I think their timing is perfect. And in this crazy world, I think their readings are exactly what we need to be hearing um, this evening. So I will read one um, short poem. I first want to say thank you to the city of St. Petersburg for sponsoring um, the Dolly Poetry Series. And I want to do a shout out too to the museum. We are celebrating our 10th anniversary in our new site. And if you haven't been um, to the museum, I hope that you will make a, a trip. I've already told Sarah and Michael, you need to know this too, that whenever you come back, we will comp you a visit um, because we are excited and grateful that you've joined us this evening. So, okay. This is kind of an odd, um, an odd poem. It's, um, it is a, a little bit about my mother who passed away back in March. It is um, also probably a pandemic poem in, in many ways. Um, and I'm reading it in part because I know that Sarah references many doors in her book that we're gonna be hearing from this evening. Um, so this poem is called Breathe. Old screen with a broken latch that rattles a jar and will not catch. Bag of air, fan of fire, sour whisper of desire. In, out, out, in. Are you spirit? Are you wind? Spurred gasp or slightest moan, a rasp of bird that drags a stone. The up and down of ladder rungs, rusting in the drowning lungs. And measured like the fluted bones, the body dances to alone. There, a strand of auburn hair falls lightly on her dampened skin. Are you wind? Are you spirit? The body hanging on alone until exhausted, can you hear it? Finally rests behind the door that locked and private though it is, never stops banging. So, you know, again, have we ever seen such a crazy week, right? And, um, you know, we're just lucky that the timing of having Michael and Sarah join us, it, it fits perfectly, I think, with part of what we will hear in their poems because they address so many issues that I think are relevant to the chaos that we're all living through right now. So, um, but they do it with, they do it with such power because even though they are um, often talking about grappling with issues of identity or impermanence, um, their poems are so grounded. Their imagery is so striking um, to me and their use of metaphors. So I hope when you hear them read this evening, you'll really tune in um, to how they're doing that. It's, um, it's truly amazing. I want to first introduce Michael. Um, Michael Torres was born and brought up in Pomona, California where he spent his adolescence as a graffiti artist. His first full length collection of poems, an incomplete list of names right here, fabulous book, um, was selected by Raquel Salas Rivera for the National Poetry Series and will be published by Beacon, er, and was published by Beacon Press in 2020. And by the way, um, please check out tombelow.com um, tomblobooks.com to order their books if you don't have them already. 
um, um, Alsace Valentine. We'd love to help you do that. And, um, uh, or you can pick them up in the wonderful indie bookstore that we have in downtown St. Pete. Um, so Michael's work has appeared or is forthcoming in Poetry Magazine, Plowshares, The Georgia Review, Waterstone Review, Ninth Letter, The Sun, um, and online as the Missouri Review's Poem of the Week, um, among many other journals. His honors include awards and support from the NEA for the Arts, the, Bro the Breadloaf Writers Conference, Canto Mundo, and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Um, he is an assistant professor in the MFA program at Minnesota State University, Mankato, and a teaching artist in the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. So please visit his website, um, michaeltorieswriter.com. Welcome, Mike Michael. So glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for uh, having me and Sarah, and uh, thank you to the Dali Museum. Um, so I'll be reading from the book and also a couple of new poems. Um, and when I was thinking, uh, I was talking to Sarah the other day and thinking about, you know, the, we were thinking about the theme, what was it the self and the other? Um, and, and I had thought of, um, I was watching this interview with the poet, uh, Henrik Nordbrandt, and he had um, referenced a Wallace Stevens poem that begins, I am what is around me. And so you mentioned we talk about identity a lot. And I think that line, I am what is around me, comes through in like the sort of um, struggles with writing about the other or into the other um, in my work, at least. So um, yeah, I'll just jump right into it. Um, so the first poem is going to be um, from, there's a series of poems in the book. Um, each one of them is titled All American Mexican. And these ones like specifically uh, grapple with this identity of, you know, being a Mexican American. So I'll read the one that comes in at the first part of the book. All American Mexican. I don't know if I made these knuckles for nothing. They came from home, from a body bounced off the hood of a Chevy Cobalt. We couldn't turn away. Knuckles from big brothers asking why you flinched, you scared or what. Grunted knuckles, juniors rattled heart. Knuckles fashioned from boxing gyms, air thick with sweat, our wrapped hands in a jump rope. The owner's son, Mikey, and his quick hands, his golden gloves, getting us to run miles to dance along the ropes, in through your nose, out through your mouth, like that. Knuckles for when we danced with girls whose boyfriends found us at the house party, ready for the gasp of those gathered, an echo of bodies bound for out. When I left, I didn't say goodbye to any of this. When I left, I told the homies, the homies told me they love me and I love them. Even though when we said it, we chased our I love yous with laughter the way you caged the air to catch a butterfly. You can't be too sure who's listening. This is the kind of cocoon each of us floated from. We like to be more beasting than butterfly anyway. This story was never going to be about the homie who got out the hood with his right hook. There was no college scholarship. I don't like the word adversity as much as I think I should. It takes up too many angles, reminds me of standardized testing. How much do you think about where I come from? If you imagine where I come from, please proceed down the block. Absence is not wind through a window, but the bothered walls of a flame. Do you see in that light, yeah, the plastic okay. chair my father left under an apple tree he planted the day I was born? That's the story I'm always moving toward, but right now, I'm on a couch at the professor's house, and there are two of me. One sits, legs crossed, a glass of wine in his hand. I don't know what kind he offered, and I said, sure, that'd be delightful. Right now, there's a podcast I think he'd be interested in. I've been designing my life around being the person who says, suffice to say, the professor makes a joke. My laughter surrounds me. The other me floats between the professor and the glass, not wondering what this man thinks of my use of the word dichotomy. Did I say it right? I'm well, thank you. I'm good at being American. I clean up after my dog. I follow the paved path on runs, sweat inside expensive sneakers. I'm a great neighbor, even on morning strolls where I forget my ID and must worry about police who need to make sure everyone is who they say they are. And if I can't confirm myself, what do I become? My university of hoodie, just the hoodie, my jaw, my body's angles, where are you from, homie? I've always had the ability to vanish. It can happen like that. 
how much do words like dichotomy weigh in a mouth like mine? And if I go, my wife won't know what happened until the news flashes a photo where I'm bald and not smiling. I can fit the description, sure, delightful, but not this morning. This morning, without ID, I'm alive to witness branches hop with birds, even when there aren't any birds. Some call it wind. If you ask me, I watch the sky. I'm good, my G. I can't stop thinking of that time I saw an acrobat show at the county fair where a woman walked on stage spinning plates on sticks. She smiled at each, as each plate wobbled without falling, and when she finished, she bowed. I stood up to applaud at how she held it all together. This is a plate spinning, a fan wedged into the window of my childhood bedroom, the foil my mother taped over the glass, those tiny blurred mirrors it held, my multiple selves. In one iteration, it's me who spends the afternoon chasing butterflies in his backyard. In this one, it's me who sweeps the air, my glass jar. Boys from down the block do not come over with questions, and they do not laugh like their fathers. This is not the one where I grow up down for whatever, with a kind of tough that grinds bones for gold dust. I don't say fuck it if I don't mean it, the way Junior did when the regal came up the block with its headlights cut, how he crossed his arms over his chest. Sometimes I get tired of tightening my jaw before bathroom mirrors, and there are days when all I do is search YouTube for talk show clips where the veteran is brought home to surprise their family, everyone reaching for each other. I can't stop going back to the part where the soldier appears crisp from backstage as if for the first time. Most often I wanna be uncategorized, one plate among many. I got invited to dinner. If you could just give me the dimensions of this place, no? The professor says instead, good night. And I wanna say stay up or peace out. And I want the other, other me to unlatch the gate so I can be angelic in Nike Cortez's, a flutter departure, no one there to ID me. Um, so let's see which one to read next. Actually, I'll read some, a couple of the new ones. Um, so this one is a prose poem that was um, written after reading Jose Hernandez Diaz is the fire eater. It's a really dope chat book. Um, and I had this persona, Ignacio, that I was just writing through for some reason. <laughs> and so this one is called Ignacio Contemplates Ghost Dumb. Mm -hmm. Ignacio walks the dark, quiet halls of the school building where school building where he works, emptying trash bins and spot cleaning the office floor carpets of careless professors. He wants to believe in ghosts. He tries to remember the shoes of the dead. His grandfathers were leather and instead of laces, they had what looked like tiny leather broom bristles. He's sad that his memory won't give him back the perfume of his long gone grandmother, just the image of the kitchen table where she always sat, its yellow plastic cover, the curtains behind her shut, the lacework accented by sun. In the hallway, the motion sensor lights do not register Ignacio. They haven't this whole time. Ignacio thinks of running, but is afraid nothing will happen. And where will I go then? He shouts in his head. So um, I'm trying to stay out of the sun. Um, so I, uh, this next one, so it was another um, persona poem, but it ended up, I ended up switching it back to first person. And I don't know why I feel like I felt uncomfortable when it was in third person and it was in the Ignacio point of view. And for some reason, um, I felt like I needed to switch it back to the I. And I did that actually uh, only like the other day. So we'll see if it actually works. Um, but I feel strongly about the poem, if anything else, if nothing else. It's called The Cave. I sit in my truck, the only person in the lot. Across from me, a gathering of what sounds like friends outside a Catholic outreach center that ad advertises free barbecue and root beer and a taste of salvation on Friday nights. I'm reading a book under the light poles shine in the center of the lot. With the window halfway down, the light strikes a thin shadow across my page. Tomorrow afternoon, my daughter will be born. Right now, through the window, I hear someone laugh, say, no way, further out, there's a storm. Lightning bolts desire sky. The rain will either arrive or miss me entirely and I can't decide which will help promote the best version of myself. 
I listen for thunder, but catch only a few words from the maybe Catholics. Then the smell of charcoal, more laughter after that. Another car pulls into a spot near me. A man younger than me gets out and pulls a skateboard from his back seat. I don't notice that I've closed the book on my lap. The younger man locks his doors and rides away on the skateboard. I stare, ride away with him. There's a breeze then, and what the breeze carries. All right, um, so I'll read um, maybe a couple more from the book. So I um, work with the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. And so before the pandemic, I was able to go into the prison once a week and um, teach teach the, the students in the facility. And this um, poem came from a free write while I was in the, in the prison teaching and they were doing free write. So I decided to write something as well. It's called From My Classroom Window at the Prison Before Students Arrive. All right, there's sun the whole way through. Um, because the blinds stay open, I see birds. I watch how men watch those birds. They monitor flight paths and a soaring appetite for the crumbs they shouldn't have pocketed from chow. The indifferent birds ask for nothing, yearn for nothing, except perhaps the sky, which is nothing to them but magnetic blue wind, their one great war of journey. I've been thinking about mine lately, my own great war. Once I met a man who'd been waiting hours for a storm to hit. At the park, he told me how difficult flight is for birds. He stared at the humming sky and disappeared. Later that night, I could not fall asleep, not with a fact like that. Instead, I sat at my coffee table and fed a dying rubber fig tree, filtered water, and the eggshells I broke apart, calling them my little countries. I thought of being president. Then I asked myself, why can't I be king? When I arrived at the idea of God, I began to float. When I woke, I understood my only burden is that of a simple life of a man who can go home and think and care for plants that do not know he is their father. If I am no one to these leaves, to whom do I belong? Thus, my great war is with myself, a wingspan of stirring thoughts that ask what's next, that wait for my response like the men beyond this window, breadcrumbs, tiny questions for birds. Each man tossing a piece at the air anticipates a swooping answer tries not to think of what goes uneaten, of what falls towards death, wet and certain, that patch of grass they walk, its cold blades, it's late October, every step stiff and speechless. Um, so, all right, I will end with another all-American Mexican poem, if I can just find it. It's the last one in the, in the book, so like I said, there's three of them. And this one, um, this one came last in the book. And it also came as like, when I was doing the series, I thought I was going to be settled with just, just the two. Um, but this one's actually turned out to be one of my favorites. So yeah, all American Mexican. All I wanted was a Cadillac on Chrome, real diamonds in my ears and someone to call my name through a crowd. Instead, me and the homies drove to the mall in my hatchback, rocking dog tags with Tupac on them. We lived for his west side fingers. We stopped at nothing but silver, a store where I sifted through glinting trays of jewels for princess cut earrings. No one asked if we needed help, but everyone stared a long time. No one called our names, so we took new ones, swallowed them whole, and they grew inside us. Inside the food court bathroom, our new names bloomed black from magnum markers. Inside stalls, I practiced the R, the E, the M, the E, the K, our names too real for us to contain. We left, and I was glad my hatchback's bubbled up window tint distorted our faces. Everything is always up for interpretation. Yesterday, I ran an image search of the white boy from 10th grade who said I looked like a dog. I wanted to find him posing in a too wide tie for a job his face would tell me he hated. When I found nothing, I thought he might be dead, so I looked for a park to sit with my guilt, wondering if I could have saved him had we become friends instead, had I helped him retrieve his stack of notes blown apart by the wind. I am mostly filled with fantasies where I'm the hero, the parade and a coupe de ville away from the key to the city the mayor presents on a red velvet pillow. Now when I visit home, 
I want to cry, but the homies would notice. And it's not that they laugh and call me a little bitch. No, we are only as young and thuggish as America needs us to be. The problem is my homies wouldn't recognize the puzzle my body has made of itself. Let me say it like this. I'm a stuffy June room and the homie has only been taught to pry open whatever might test him. That's real. Once I was so real, I became a cathedral at noon. Not the bell itself, but the rope pulling sound from absence. I was only my heart glowing against the bones holding me back. Everyone stood to watch. Someone yelled fight. Someone said I was scared, but I was so real. I burst into the wind like fuck the world. Nothing dissolves like I do. I came here to create a diversion, to splinter furniture for the fire. If I'm going to be real, I am who I've always been, a boy seeking an orbit to align with. One day, I'm a get poet tatted on my chest. Only instead of the O, I want a window through which you can see my childhood backyard, way before I became something like a souvenir. I might make my artist ink the tire swing. He says, the worst that'll hurt depends on where I want to plant the trees. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> wow, Michael, this, uh, those were some terrific poems. And I'm not sure we've heard quite enough of them yet. I may have to, <laughs> during our Q&A, I might have to ask you to read one or two more. Um, that, was, that was a great reading. One thing I noticed with both of you guys is that, um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that um, Juan Felipe Herrera plugged both you guys. Right on, your, on the backs of your books, and and I know for your book, Michael, it's, he says that your book is shattering and groundbreaking, and um, I I couldn't agree more. Um, so thank you for that reading, and um, we'll hold our Q and A, of course, until after Sarah reads, as well. So okay, Sarah Borjas, Sarah's debut collection of poetry, which is right here, is. Heart like a window, mouth like a cliff. Hope you can see that. And you want to order both of these poets' books um, from Tom Below. Um, it was published by uh, Noemi, <laughs> Noemi <laughs> Press in 2019 as part of the Akalika series and winner of a 2020 American Book Award. Um, Sarah was named one of Poets and Writers' 2019 debut poets and is a 2017 Canto Mundo Fellow. Her work can be found on the Breakbeat Poets Anthology, Volume 4, um, Latinx, Latinx, Plowshares, The Rumpus, Poem a Day by the Academy of American Poets, and The Offing, amongst others. She teaches creative writing at the University of California, Riverside, and lives in Los Angeles, and stays rooted in Fresno, which permeates all of your wonderful book, um, which I so enjoyed. Find out a lot more about Sarah at her website, um, www.sarahborjas.com. Welcome, Sarah. So glad that you could be here. And you are amazing to be stopping at a park to do this <laughs> on your road trip. <laughs> so. Thanks for having me, Helen. And thanks for inviting me. Um, thanks to Dolly Museum. We, Michael and I will definitely take you up on that uh, trip to the museum. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. <laughs> So thank you. Hope you will. Uh, it's an honor to be reading with Michael too. So um, Michael and I have known each other for a, for a minute, and it's the first reading we've done a lot of work too, but we've never read together. So that's great. Shout out to Michael. Good, good. So I'm going to read a poem to start that is not uh, my own, but a cento that I wrote um, after teaching a bunch of young poets. Um, Puente is a club like a program offered in California for community college students, Latinx students, you know, mostly, but really students from any background. And it kind of like mentors them through community college transfer to uh, four-year colleges. So I taught there this last year and I stole a line of each of the Puentistas and made a poem. So a idea. these are not my words, um, but the Puentistas, Puentistas of 2020. To whom have you spoken? Remember me for my ambition. Movement is part of our blood. I'm headed to a funeral to catch a custom pinata, the exact glint of an eye. In my veins, the ghosts come out. Your name is found fighting 
for the American dream. It was never my answer, just another person's education. Education should not be a death sentence. They sympathize for my mistake. I'm not prolific, but I wasn't just going to sit and watch. I don't have to be like others to be beautiful. I want to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Students, you know, they're teenagers, so yeah. um, they're smarter than us. <laughs> so <laughs> for a while longer. <laughs> Uh, my mom named me after a Hall & song, Sarah Smile, uh, and let's talk about that. My name disappears from the script. My name was chosen on a night black as the back of my grandmother's knees. Joints burned in my parents' hands, one end to another, and smoke wove them together on the hood of a car. My mother says, when the band played Sarah Smile, I knew. Some words are so pretty, they never leave. She was 16, her body rocked on the hot black top of her high school. This is a dream, this is not a dream I have. Although, I like to dream people up the way I want them. Otherwise, I, the girl with leaky tires. I, the girl with long slutty hair. I, the girl with mismatched boobs. I, the girl who makes a stripper the most difficult cocktail and the most beautiful. I, the girl who talks to my parents like children. I, the girl who listens to their stories and wishes to be someone else inside them. In the Bible, Sarah bore a son at 100 years old. In the Bible, Sarah is both the wife and sister of Abraham. In the Bible, God says things and they happen so. I, girl with a heart that has an idea. I, girl whose entire body resists the idea. I, a nameable duty of Chicanisma. I, converted Chicana who learns her Hebrew name does not make her white, even though Paul Anouk's crew is two syllables the delicate way they do. I designed the anecdote. I talk too much. I speak around my name. I mix all the racket, who I am, who I'll no longer be. No wife, no mother, no child of mine to ever feel compelled. No woman's spitting image, no man's model of love. No one's daughter, no one's daughter, no one's daughter. My heart has a plan. God, still asleep, and this is her, drunk and dreaming. I want to dream together, or at least be gone before she wakes. If the name is a spirit, then Sarah, the absence of Abraham or anyone's spouse or the obligation to the story that God gets drunk on, then retells in my voice on the hottest, clearest nights. Wow. Um, this poem is called Mouth Like a Cliff. Every night, I lay down more naked in my bed, eyes open, confessing my secrets, palms up, and still, men do not return. I've lost most of myself in whips of air drafted by the footsteps of a man leaving again and again. I've spent my life learning the inherent helplessness of my body. Water stumbles where my face should be. A desert begins in my mother's throat and ends in mine. A choppy wind spins a story out of size. I ritualize, sanctify desire for its own sake, like those words repeated before sleep. My parents praying on their knees beside my bed, sacrificing the inconsiderable truth of our life so I could dream. We begged God together, pressed our hands and rhymed our pleas. Now, I just dissemble each memorized syllable. Father, God, beloved, each familiar and singular touch. I need ceremony to kneel. 
I have begged so many men. I regard it as method, style. Decide the weight of me will be an issue that threatens every daughter's world. I spread my makings out on a long yard of time like a metaphysical yard sale. Two gallons of infinite milk. A medium sized rug and tongue for tassels. Some mouths unhooked from the softest words. Mouth like a cliff. A man who might have loved my Nick's memories. I'll ask my dad to put neon signs I make on the telephone poles. Each one will be a picture of my body with a bright hole in my chest. Another body falling into it. So I had a, a really good friend of mine who, um, <laughs> who asked if she should do a panel um, for a conference on race, um, and every and every everybody on the panel was white, and, and nobody has talked about whiteness, and so I wrote this poem, and uh, for her, <laughs> and uh, she likes it, so I'll share it. Um, all white panel on race. <laughs> about all the times we were solicited for our political poems about the symbolism of tuna casserole porcelain supremacy about all the times we were asked what it felt like to be american and also white how we felt we had to choose we quoted Debo about how i could never forget my whiteness how i wear it like skin about self-care how I choose to watch Married with Children instead of explain cultural appropriation to my boyfriend. About how it's hard to love people who can't see you when you so clearly see yourself. About how every panel you are asked to participate in has the word identity in the title. About how you are regarded as an authority on race. About how you satisfy the word diversity with your part-time position at the university how they ask you to give talks, about how you wait for your annual contract, about how the workshops you've been in are more terrified of critiquing your work than they are of being a lazy reader, a lazy poet maybe, how silence debilitates the poetry, about how everyone asks you to write about your struggle, your racist aunts and uncles, to code switch between German and Norwegian when you never spoke them, not ever. About how you can't tell if you're white or you're performing your whiteness. If enough people tell you who you are, you can transform. About how white people actually do not fuck better when they are sad. About the denial of pleasure, the constant expectation of trauma. About inheritance. About the thin blue string of legacy hanging from your consciousness like an inescapable flag. Wow. And I'll read a few more. Oh, I, I see my rapist's daughter. What I remember is the way he turned off the light. Even now, I'm grateful I didn't have to watch him walk out. I can't tell if the tenderness with which I see his daughter and adore her is a projection of myself, the poofy bangs, the purple barrettes my mother decorated my long hair with. They wore me. When I stiffed them a skirt. I just wanted to run like my brother in his cargo shorts. She fits. If I can stack her wardrobe, inside my knowledge of systems and my latest desire to be close with a man. I forgive the pink vortex clamping my thighs. I treated it like a sentence. She smiles for her father, my rapist, my prime number in sex, man who has not yet left her and forgotten to take her with him. I try not to hate that girl. Although her red Dora shirt and socks ruffle remind me why I'm here. The hem of her skirt and tiny teeth are the center of this memory. On a twin-sized bed, 
my knees split like dead crickets, my scream devoured by my own groveling tongue, a man always in me. Um, two more poems. This poem, um, my brother's in the Air Force. He, actually when he was young and I felt like something that is like a cultural value and, and like Chicano culture is loyalty uh, to family. And I, I'm learning um, through my you know, family and with my brother um, how loyalty changes sometimes to nation uh, here in the United States and especially uh, between my brother and I, what it's like uh, with, the, you know, with the consequences are of war <laughs> and nationalism and patriotism um, on something like um, a brother and a sister relationship like that. It's called Doors. A soldier knocks on a door and opens it. His family is sitting on a rug. My brother's family sits on a rug. I am not there. A soldier knocks on a door, opens it, makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for dinner. A soldier's family is thinly spread over each time he walks through a door that is or is not his own. My brother knocks on a door and forgets whose house he is. A soldier pounds on a door in allegiance. He leaves pieces of himself everywhere he goes. My brother pounds on his pieces and calls them patriotic. A soldier pounds on a home, but sometimes I think it's my house. I pound on my brother's door and cannot enter. I pound on my brother's loyalty and cannot see in the dark. I pound on my brother's dark, shaped like a soldier. I pound on this poem instead of my brother. I'm afraid of his answer. I fall asleep in my hands each time, these words knocking at my face. I pound on love and find myself pounding on traditional terms. I pound on my brother and he sings the national anthem. I pound on a photo my brother keeps of us during deployments and beat the empty air. I pound in the daylight and the nighttime and not even the neighbor's mariachi music consoles me. Who I think my brother is depends on the year he moved out of our house. Now, I beg on a strange carpet. I pound on my brother so he'll tell me just once he would do anything for me but he won't, not even in the house of this poem. My brother won't even walk through the doors. His family is not here. No. And this is the last poem I'll read. I'm, I'm working on it. And I, I feel like there's other poems that are not coming from it. Um, but, you know, it's something I'm excited about. And I think after writing the book, and this is something like when I talked about, people ask, like, well, what are you writing next? And you're like, man, I'm recovering. <laughs> I'm recovering. <laughs> so this is like coming out of recovery poem. <laughs> um, white. I'm so white. I got straight A's and chose French class over Spanish. When I finally took Spanish, and got all the, I got all the homework wrong because my mom said the teacher's Spanish all messed up. I was so white, I hated tacos. I was so white, I hated beans. I was so white, I thought it was dirty. I was so white, I stopped playing softball so I wouldn't get dark in the summer anymore. I was so white, I called my friend Carlos midnight because he was so dark. I'm so white, I don't think it's a big deal. I'm so white. I conflate being Latinx with being black. I'm so white, I don't think I can be anti-black if I'm Latinx. Anyways, back in the day I was so white, I was afraid of the dark. I'm so white, I'm still afraid of the dark. I'm so white, I'm afraid of people, like any people. I'm so white, I'm afraid of even more white people. I'm so white, I'm staring at a lake right now, writing a poem. I'm so white, I'm wearing a cardigan with girls on it. I'm so white, I only dated white boys in my teens. I'm so white, I never thought about why I only dated white boys in my teens. I'm so white, I was thankful my white boyfriends cried for black people and migrants in cages. 
I'm so white, I like to read poems about black people and migrants in cages. I'm so white, I'm super angry right now. I'm so white, I'm angry at white people. I'm so white, I'm not even exhausted yet. I'm so white, we should listen to this one podcast. I'm so white, my syllabus is the same every year, but I'll never get fired. I'm so white, I say racist shit about white women not winning the Pulitzer, reading clips by poets of color, and cry in my mansion, and use my book contracts to wipe my tears. I'm so white, I'm really uncomfortable right now. I'm so white, I think my discomfort might be suffering. I'm so white, actually, I am suffering. I'm so white, I'm an individual. I'm so white, I want to know how I can help, but know that I'm asking as an individual. I'm so white, you gotta do better, I'm saying. I'm so white, I'm having an identity crisis right now. I'm so white, I don't know where I came from, but I could look it up. I'm so white, when people tell me to go back to where I came from, I say to where? I'm from here, but I never look it up. I'm so white, like now more than ever. I'm so white, I say voting for Trump was based on economic issues. I'm so white, I defend white people I'll never meet or don't know and will never know. I'm so white, I stand up for poor white people over black, Latinx, Asian American, or indigenous, or any other people who are poor, but who maybe are not people. I'm so white, I'm crying in this meeting. I'm so white, I'm crying in this meeting. I'm so white, I'm crying in this meeting. I'm so white, I'm crying in this meeting next to this beautiful lake. I'm so white, only my friends of color can console me. I'm so white, I look to nature so I'm not distracted by what's going on. I'm so white. Did you know my daughter is in college and very political? I'm so white. I see trees and think about dignity. And I think I deserve to think about trees. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Wow, it was a great, great reading. Sarah, you, you, had, you had the wind behind you joining in. <laughs> um, but... Um, but I think we 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 were still able to um, to get the power of your words, and um, this is a terrific terrific reading. And I just wanted to read from the back of your book, um, as I did uh, from Michael's. So Juan Felipe Herrera Herrera said, "This is a groundbreaker. Goodbye to fashionable old stuff. Adios to graspable to adios to the graspable that can never be touched. Come to the fearless a brava shaking collection. That's pretty cool." Um, yeah, and I think we could we all heard that in in both um, in both books and and your readings, and I, I what impresses me so much is that I think you know there's absolutely a role for politics and poetry. I, I think um, especially now, I think it's so important. But I love the way both of you um, approach it because you do it through the stuff of the world. You know, it's grounded. There's nothing. I think otherwise it can kind of start to become a little bit didactic if it's if if it's not um, grounded in imagery and, and metaphor. So um, I, I just think you both do that so well. So, so thank you for those, those readings. I, I do want to ask if you will both indulge us. Both of your books um, have an Ars Poetica and them. In fact, I think, let's see, I believe it might be Sarah's book that has two, if I remember correctly. And Michael, you have one as well. Um, Michael, would you mind reading that um, Ars Poetica and then Sarah, I'll ask you to choose one of yours to read as well um, so that we can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, um, okay, let me find it right here. Uh, let me see. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's called Ars Poetica. <laughs> In the photograph, the sun sharp across sky covers the street behind us. It must be late afternoon. Everyone says hurry. A camera cl clicks. We walk away from the scene of the crime just before security gets there to ask if we painted those names. Of course, the other day the freight train's horn blared through my window and I thought of hopped fences and what being 15 was like again, as if the train's echo, the way it opened up, was wide enough to hold all those years. But it can't. And I can't tell you the streets where my homies grew up. Not anymore. Not the names of their little brothers who followed us around, swinging branches at ivy bushes. That photo holds us there and does not. Not really. We left the frame and did not look back at our names until the city had covered them. 
until it was too late, names met with deletion. What did we become but an echo we called the future? And those boys in the photo I stuck in a box with everything else I owned and taped shut. I don't know where they are. The morning I left, my parents held each other in the frame of my truck's mirror and shrank as the road opened miles and miles under a widening sky that dwindled finally over a Midwestern apartment and a life that turned into mine. Now I look out a window and I cannot go back, not really. I have this photograph to stare at without knowing who he became. There is the sun, slightly left fences we jumped, a wide field, its stubborn weeds breaking through earth, a trace of oil near tracks, trains covered with our names bearing their slow metal death in a quiet Colorado yard we'll never see, a hiss of stars over nothing. Once I asked the sky what it remembers, a type of prayer for what I could not take with me. Tonight, all the train cars are gone. No one I grew up with rents a room in this town. This poem has taken me years to reach because every name on the wall, even my own, rang out across the sky and fell over a field that no longer exists. Our homegirl, who found us in the frame of the disposable, who we hurried, pretending not to care, says, okay, I'm done, and means it. She moves, marries, and makes a home somewhere in Arizona. Echoes, listen to my steps across the hardwood, a sound that adopts the air it moves through that decays behind me. It rents a room in my mind. This could be a moment to measure distance with. This isn't a poem. It's a history book recorded with Krylon buffed out by city employees who were just doing their jobs. Wall after wall, like pages we kept leading our names on, the color of loss, flat black or something close. I've never been as precise as a blade of light. Those homies under the sun, they're more phantom than for real. My homies, I mean. There must be someone better for this job than me. Outside my window, the street melts into a quiet that tells me I'm not the only one who forgets. I want to ask God what kind of gathering this is and why. If there is a home for me to go back to, I'm not sure I know how to get there. Wonderful. Terrific. And Sarah, would you read yours as well? And then we'll talk. Whichever. Sure. sure. Uh, I'll read Dars Poetica. It's a numbered, it's like a list of poems. It's after uh, a poem called uh, Five Directions to My House by Juan Felipe Herrera. Dars Poetica. It's just like, my mom's here club is coming. We have Camellia Bush in the front yard. And the, you guys know when they die, like, they're just like all over the sidewalk. Uh, Sarah, I wonder if you lean in a little more if maybe the wind won't be quite as... What about if I do this? A lot better. Yeah, let's get that. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Ars Poetica. One, step over each camellia's head flattened on the sidewalk. Two, listen to Al Green's How Can You Mend a Broken Heart. Three, go to the window. Pink petals nestled in your hands. Four, whisper your mother's name, each syllable like falling lace. Five, if you sweep the kitchen, you can sweep the kitchen so your mother can be more than a mother. Six, each missing syllable is scattered subtext. Seven, I can think of younger days when living for my life. Eight, Stop calling your mother camellias. Nine, say Criselda. Ten, a daughter must find her mother's first house. Eleven, open the window. Twelve, she chose you over herself. Thirteen, raised a rare girl. Fourteen, let me live again. Fifteen, Vision is a principle. 16, imagination a form. 17, it doesn't matter that no one ever taught you. 18, her head can flower against your hands. It's wonderful. And we could hear you very well when you did it that way. So yeah, 
It's, so I'm curious about those poems. Um, so of course, you know, in Ars Poetica, um, there are somewhat different definitions, but basically it's, it's what your own theory of what poetry is for you, right, as a poet. And could you each talk about that with respect to the poems you read? Um, you know, Sarah, yours is a list poem, um, almost a sort of how-to in some ways. Um, but could you talk a little bit about that? Both of them are certainly juggling, again, that issue of identity that seems so central to all of your poems. But um, I, I am curious, did you sit, did you write the poem first and then realize what it was? recognize it later as an Ars Poetica? Or was it something that you knew from the start? Did you sit down with that intent? Maybe even it was generated out of a class you taught. I'm curious about that. Um. Yeah, I could speak towards the, the question, Helen. Uh, so I wrote the poem and it was just like, it really, it, it wasn't, it didn't, it was not Ars Poetica. It was just a poem where I was trying to organize what the processes of the speaker um, getting liberated from her own, um, you know, kind of obligations as a daughter, as a, as a woman, as a brown woman. And so I just was really trying to make this poem work and then ultimately uh, organize why I was feeling the way I was feeling. And then it became um, instructional at some point, um, mostly just for clarity, you know, just try to hold something so big in, in one place. And then it wasn't until the end that um, the editor said, you know, this is an Ars Poetica. And I was like, okay, cool, it's Ars Poetica. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that's interesting. I think that, that seems like that's often the case. You know, you recognize it in retrospect as, as that. Michael, how about you? Um, yeah, similarly, I had written the poem not thinking it was an Ars Poetica, not really trying to do that. But I think at the time that I wrote the poem, there were like, two poems, like the Ars Poetica was similar to another one, but I knew the Ars Poetica was doing something different even before I knew it was Ars Poetica. And I think what I was trying to do was grasp um, the fact that I had left home for like to pursue writing and that I wasn't returning. And then so I started sort of um, at a certain point in my writing life, I was starting to come to terms with that, that I had left and left everything for something else because of poetry. And so the Ars Poetica, it turned into an Ars Poetica because I realized that like, I wasn't just writing about friends and back home and my parents, but I was also writing about the fact that I was taking, that I that the speaker wanted to take on this responsibility to become a writer, uh, knowing that he left home for that. And so towards the end, it's as if my speaker, and I usually think of poems as like unravelings and towards the end of the poem the speaker is finally realizing that um they have this great task which is to to write poetry or this huge responsibility because it's no simple task and so the speaker is basically saying like i there's someone better than this than me and and i can't even go home now and so he's kind of that's kind of where i was like oh this is not just a poem about my friends this is about the speaker dealing with like become like the the responsibility of an artist and, and having left home and all that. Mm -hmm. So the word that that you just used that really caught my ear was the word unraveling. Um, did I hear that right? That's what you said. Poetry is a sort of unraveling. I'm I said uh, unraveling like to unravel. Oh, to unraveling. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And um, yeah, I, I'm I'm thinking about um, about the way we write poems. And I do want you all, if you don't mind, to talk a little bit about your process of writing poems and it, approaching as an unraveling is, is so interesting to me. In part, I know Sarah, some of your poems, you really go straight at, and I love this, the idea of craft and what it means. And you, um, you kind of take it on as so often being so so integrated into the you know the white canon and um, you know it becomes almost a sort of political thing which is which is very interesting because you say it and yet you also kind of back off from that and say it doesn't have to be you know <laughs> like you don't you don't really want it to be strictly in the domain of um, of white politics and I, I love how you do that in that poem but could you both talk a little bit about your process of writing poems and. And I, you know, your word unraveling in some ways is kind of like what I understand from some of your poems, Sarah, to be owning um, 
um, well, I don't even want to say the right. I would say the, the importance of, you know, blowing up the cannon, opening for new voices, um, you know, helping all of us, whether we're people of color or white, recognize how much other voices bring to, um, you know, the, the role of poetry and, and it's central. And so it is a kind of unraveling in some ways of the canon at the same time. Anyway, can you guys talk a little bit about your process for writing poems and how you weave in some of your own political um, discovery? That's a really broad question. I know it, but <laughs> can you give it a shot? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll tackle it. Uh, <laughs> it looks, like, yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like you kind of got it. Huh? Like, it really, I don't feel like it really does feel to me like an owning. Um, that's not what I go, that's not what I'm setting out to do as an intention when I sit to, you know, quite make uh, literature, you know, but it is what ends up happening um, when I like, I actually, you know, it's, I think someone says it's like not when you see the poem, it's when the poem sees you, right? When you are fully implicated on your own um, work, by your own work. And so the process to set out and kind of like take accountability for our own experiences and our own lives and our own feelings and thoughts we have about them. Um, the process that I usually go to, go to and talk about this, Michael, is just being as honest as I can, you know, as honest as I, as I can. And that might seem like um, not a very sophisticated technique to craft, to craft a poem, but ultimately it, it is like the last step and why not make it the first step? I feel like I, you know, I feel like some, so, you know, um, sometimes when I'm trying to craft poems and process, uh, I'm focused on all this outside like exterior work, but really it's the inner work that if I'm being honest, that verb does not is not right. That noun is is not right. That or, you know that is I would never say that. I would never say that. And I think especially when I when I was younger and I was just starting to write poems, I was trying to emulate all the poets that I had studied, and it was you know like Western canon, and it never felt right. Well, did I make it happen? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know I wrote some pretty good sonnets and like villanelles and shit, but like. Um, they weren't they weren't mine ultimately they weren't they didn't they didn't belong to me and so for process I think the most important thing is just for me to be like really 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 honest and if I am being really honest my politics my who I am in relation to everything I experience everything around me is 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 <laughs> confronted I'm not an invisible being walking through the world and I think some of the craft issues I see with like my students or like, well, I don't have anything to write about politics or I don't have any ideas or, you know, I don't feel oppressed <laughs> or I don't, I didn't do that. So I, you know, it's like, but if you see yourself as you are and you implicate yourself, those things are more clear. You know, when, when folks, I think um, for me say like, you know, you write about identity. I'm like, well, we all do. But if you don't say it, that says a lot about what you feel about your identity and that you think it's an invisible standard. And so if you go through and aren't afraid of it, there's some really rich, beautiful things in there. And if you own it, it could be poetry, I feel like. Yeah. Well, and I think you said an important word that I may want to come back to after Michael talks, and that's the word implicate. Um, if you in implicate yourself. And I think that's a key part of what, what you do also that makes it work. Um, otherwise, again, you run the danger of sounding didactic and, and neither of you do um, because you do implicate yourselves. And I guess that also gets back to your idea of honesty, because, of course, that is the more honest way to to approach it. Yeah. So, uh, Michael, how about you? Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. The process of, of writing. Yeah. Um, for me, it's usually it begins with like an image most of the time that I am uh not that I keep going back to, but sometimes I can't really like escape it. And it, and it's like kind of nagging at me and I, and I kind of, you know, I don't know what to do with it. So what usually happens is I'll write the image down and then like uh, time is a huge part of process. I, the poems take a long, a long time for me. Um, and it's usually because I wonder, like, I just ask that image, all these kinds of questions, like while I write through it, like, why is this image here? What's, what's the reason that it's, um, staying in my mind and you know why is it important and then if I find 
me or my speaker in there, I'm like, what am I, it's kind of like what Sarah said with the implication, like, what am I doing here? And, and, and like, how is my, like, what's the interaction like, and why is that important? And so it's just kind of going back and forth, asking all those questions, um, just kind of going in deeper and deeper into that image. Um, because I, I think like that image came up from an, like an unconscious level that, and so I don't, I will never probably initially know what to do with an image. And so the process is that is taking the time to kind of wait for that to, to un, unfold as I write through that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's interesting. So, um, so you often start with an image I do as well with my poems. Um, but, but Sarah, if I understood what you're saying, well, I would imagine sometimes you do the same with an image, but, but it also sounds like you often have, do you start more from an idea than you do from an isolated image or not necessarily, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I'm like the opposite. Yeah, I always start with a, with a question. Mm. It's a question, you know, I'm always like, oh my God, why, are we, why does this make me so angry? You know, why do I love my shit out of my mom? But I also have so much resent, you know, and I'd be lying if I said I did it. What is it, you know? And I go in looking for moments I felt that. And then I guess that's probably when I would come to something more concrete, like an image and that I'm getting kind of snagged on. And I would look at that image and kind of like Michael said, like unravel it to see how the way I describe it reveals the truth and the answers yeah. to my questions, you know? Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And then for both of you, how about your revision process? How much revision happens? And Michael, you said your poems take a long time to write. Um, um, and yet they're, you know, they're so smooth, they're so natural, they flow so well. Um, uh, you know, your revision process, does that, uh, do you have a particular way of doing that? I'm guessing not. I'm guessing you just do what works for that, any particular poem, but um, do you have any, any method of revision that you tend to go back to for each poem? Um, so when I, when there's a poem that's like, when it's a longer poem, I'll give that example, like, and I'm struggling with like, cause it's so maybe so big, what I usually, what I've done before. And I only remember this because I was moving a bunch of like old writing journals and like all these like writing things of mine into a big plastic bin to put in the basement. <laughs> but I found a big Ziploc bag that had the, uh, I had written all American Mexican on it. And I forgot that when I was uh, revising, it was one really big poem before it became three different poems. And I forgot that uh, at some point I printed out all the pages of that poem and cut it up into like the sections that it, that it seemed to be having. And then kind of just like try to see what was working and what, what was doing what and what was sort of connecting. And that was sort of a way for me to see the poem like in a, on a visual level differently than, you know, cause I think if I'm like looking at a poem so many times every morning, I kind of, uh, I don't see the poem anymore. I just see what I, what my mind thinks it sees. And so I actually need to, you know, print it out, cut it up and, and look at it in that sort of way. So that's kind of like one revision kind of technique that I do. But um, yeah, like, like I said, all of that happens over like a long period of time. Um, I take a lot of walks <laughs> to kind of get out of that headspace. And then, you know, I, and then I go back to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I think for revision, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just doing the same move everywhere, but I feel like I, I go, when I think I'm, you know, I'll revise. I usually like write just free write first drafts and they're just like one big block and I don't ever sit, sit down and like write a poem ever really. Um, but then what I'll do is I'll go through and um, just see where either I'm in familiar territory where that's something I say all the time, you know, because like, of course, we all have themes and obsessions in the work, right? You read like my book, you read Michael's book, like you can see the same things. Mm -hmm. But when they're, they can't, they're always like a little bit more nuanced and I feel like we're giving credit um, to, to ourselves, you know? And so I kind of like go in there and see, you know, is this truly 
the way I feel. And so I'll revise by just saying, am I lying here? Mm -hmm. Am I lying? Not am I lying? Am I lying to myself? Mm -hmm. And that takes a really long time and also depends like if you're emotionally prepared. So some poems have taken me years. Some poems I'm like, we'll never get, but I'll still write them. You know, I have poems that I had to write to get the book out, but they're not in the book. So they'll never, they'll never be out, but I needed to figure out what I really feel to make the other poems that come after it um, more clear. And other than that, um, I think arrangement is really important. So a lot of times when I'll sit down, especially maybe it's the way I write, I just write in one big stream, but, um, You'll, you know, if you, I feel, I notice I'll find like similar images or feelings or desires throughout, and I'll go through and try to um, group them and, and rearrange them so that next time they come around, because they will come around, <laughs> they've at least changed through the stanza that comes between them, wow. um, so that there's like a new angle. But of course, like I'm never gonna stop writing about my mom and being a daughter. I'm never gonna. But each time I look at it, it'll definitely be somewhere new, and the, the poem should hopefully reflect that. Yeah. Well, so what strikes me about that is um, I know that, um, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, these days villanelles just kind of aren't your thing. That's not what you're working on. <laughs> However, um, you know, when you, I think the, the most successful villanelles are those that even though the lines are recurring, um, each stanza, as you know, has to push a little bit further. Um, with that that repeating line, and it reminded me a lot of what you just said a few minutes ago. So I would argue that that even though you're you're working outside of, and I'm glad you are, um, you know the formal um, traditions. I, um, I you know I, I still feel like I see a lot of what those some of those traditions have actually taught you, and then you've just allowed them to sort of bust through the gates. So. Um, I, th I think that's really interesting. And in fact, I, I know that, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got a sonnet. Um, you've got a double, what is it? A double Petrarchan sonnet, I think in your book, right, Sarah? Um, that, 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 you know, of course blows up the form and it's not a particular rhyme scheme. And I don't recall that you're playing with that. I am a pentameter, um, but, um, but yeah, I kind of like that you still do your, you know, that you take you take those forms and then you say, you know, it's not that you want to dismiss them completely. You just want to make them your own and, 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 and kind of make your own place for them in your work. I like that a lot. So um, I was also thinking, Michael, about what you said about chopping up poems. And I've written a couple of centos also. And that's exactly what I do for those. Um, you know, I'll, I, um, I'll have, if I'm working with a particular poet's um, poems. I have all of their books around me and I find my favorite lines and, and print them all out and chop them up. And it's a great, it, it is a great way to um, both put poems together, but also to revise. So that's interesting. I, I mentioned to both of you guys that if you have a question you'd like to ask each other, um, that that's fine. I don't know if, um, if you've thought of any that you might have from one another. You know, we did chat. I feel like we kind of touched on Awesome, but uh, Michael, uh, let's see. I oh, I don't know. Do you have one? Do you have one on on deck? Um, I mean, I think you yeah, we've kind of touched on it. I don't know because I don't know. If maybe you could, it would probably be like an elaboration because I was gonna ask like how you successfully write about the other, and then I was thinking as you were reading like all the moments you talk about like uh your parents specifically like there was a line you had in I don't remember which poem but it was like that you notice that you talk to your parents like their children and I, I think like that was something that like I like that resonated with me but I felt like that I would that line would never come to me it seems so like ballsy and so like uh I don't know and so I was just like how how do you like I don't know end up successfully writing about the other especially because and maybe this is what we kind of talked about, like with, with, with balance, if it, if that has anything to do with it, because um, I, I think about when I, when I talk about the other in some way, that's going to have a reflection of myself. So like, I think you, a, a person or a poet has to have that sort of balance, uh, have to, has to find a healthy balance because when they talk about someone else, they are also talking about themselves. So I don't know, like if there's, anything you want to add about like talking about the other or maybe in writing about your 
like gra- not grappling with, but like approaching or writing through or into when you write about like parents and things like that. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, that's yeah, that's like the struggle, right? Like, how do I write ethically? How do I write responsibly? I think the first, like Michael saying, like about our families and our friends, people like that are actual like we have relationships with, so we don't want to like uh, betray them, right? <laughs> but but at the same time, like. Uh, how do we write about this part of our lives or these real feelings that we have? And um, I think for me, it's just like admitting and always acknowledging that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from my own body. I'm not an omniscient observer, right? I'm not a disembodied voice, <laughs> you know? I'm a brown woman in her 30s on the West Coast with these specific backgrounds. And all, that just enriches and informs my, the perspective, and especially with like, um, like family. You know, I'll never say my mom feels this way. I'll say, I see this about my mom. I feel my mom feels this way. What does that say about me? You know, it's just that she's just the catalyst for an insight into my own life. But I can never really speak speak for them, and so. When we write ethically, um, too, there's a really, really dope, if you haven't read Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong, do it now. <laughs> and read Stand Up. It's the second essay in the book. But she talks about how she got really depressed about poems and she was like into stand-up comedy. And she even started doing stand-up comedy for a second. And she was talking about how uh, she was watching Richard Pryor and how, you know, he never goes and says a joke. Comedians can't say a joke's um, disembodied. They always say, this is a joke. I'm speaking to it as, as a black man at this moment in time. Um, and it's never, it's so rich. It's so layered. And um, she says, poets try to talk <laughs> like they don't have a body or they try to write sometimes like as if they don't have a body. And she's also uh, quotes a lot of Susan Sontag and how Susan Sontag, um, you know, emphasizes that we have to like, if we're driving like a character in a novel or in, in a prose, we're also she's driving it as a white woman, and that has to be acknowledged. And it also it enriches the text, um, and it's just really, I can sleep at night, <laughs> no way, you know. And, and the best thing is I can sleep at night. Um, nobody has ever like knocked me for saying that I talk to my parents that way. You know, my mom has not disowned me, and if anything, she said like, you know, I never thought about my life so closely she appreciates it and we honestly have a little more honesty between us i don't know but michael what about you your experience with them kind of writing Um, ethically especially because you write about a lot of friends so i'm curious about how it is with friends with you too um i think um I remember when i realized the book because i had a lot more i was looking at my thesis the other day uh, and I had a lot more parent poems and a lot more father poems. And at some point it became more about the, the relationship with friends. And I think um, it, it's, it's kind of like similar to what you're saying. My, my hope is that when they read, my, okay, my first hope was that when they read the book or the poems that they would say, oh yes, this is true. This, this happened to us. And then I, I wanted the the hope to be that they would read the book and say oh this is real right or like this is honest and this is true and so um and what i feel like is similar to with your work is that like i i might say like something my friends did or something they went through but then i will also mention uh what that does to the speaker the effect it has on the speaker uh, and, and like why the speaker or just the fact that it affects the speaker so that I am also like, you know, I feel like I could never, uh, there's a lot of we that gets used in the book because I feel like whatever my friends did, like I was there for it too. So I couldn't say like, they did this thing. It was always like, we did this thing and we went through this thing. And it just so happens to be that I'm the one who ends up writing about it. So, you know, at this point in time. And so there is a lot of like, you know, how am I, you know, implicating myself, kind of what we've talked about before. Um, Yeah, and I really like what you had said about in your process, like, am I lying? Am I lying to myself? I think, I think that's why, like, 
when I when you have those certain lines, like I, the image I get in my head of when you approach is that you keep coming to this, like if the truth is this like window through you that you, one looks through, you keep coming up to the window to see what is there. Like you always do that in your poems. And, and that, that's why I really admire about them is that like, like when I felt like there was just so much honesty in one moment, you come back with another moment of like pure honesty that, that like, and in the, with, within like implicating the self that I really appreciate. And so, um, I don't know, I, it's made me think, cause we, there was a lot of similarities in some of our work too. Like, uh, the, I don't remember which poem, maybe the, the I'm so white one, but it was like the podcast. And like, I had mentioned the podcast in my all American Mexican poem. And then in your other poem, uh, I think where you have, you mentioned that you had a friend named midnight and like, I, after the book, after my book was done, I had realized that like, I had left out uh, a name of like all those incomplete lists of names and it would happen on an unconscious level but it was a name of this like uh, really, you know, darker skinned Mexican American that we like called him midnight or we called like he had, a, it was kind of like a, we called him like a derogatory term and I unconsciously left his name out. And now I'm like, you know, now I'm going back into that moment and like trying to implicate myself or grapple with this idea of like, well, why did I do that? You know, like, you know why like because now his story is not he's not part of the story and i am having to kind of deal with that now too like what does it have to, going back to what does it have to do with me and so so that's kind of how i feel about all that now yeah yeah you know and again another really good word grapple right um that's another thing that i in, that i admire about um both of your uh, your books, I, I hear you grappling. I hear questions. You're often asking questions and you seem to both allow yourselves, um, you you allow, it, it, there's an assumption that everything's in, in, uh, impermanent and that the, the who you are now could be very different than who you will be next week and certainly who you were a week ago. And, and I like that fluidity in your poems and that feels very honest to me. Um, and, and, you know, even as readers, of course, when we read a poem, um, it's that reading response theory, you know, we, re we read a poem, but when we read it a month from now, we're not gonna read it exactly the same way. We may have experiences that then affect how we read that poem. Um, but I get that, that feeling of fluidity in your poems that almost strikes me as a kind of kindness to the self to allow yourselves that, uh, you know, to, to, to just sort of assume um, that, that we are going to be you know, changing and identity is not static. And, um, and uh, you know, I, um, there's a freedom in that acknowledgement, I think. And um, I think you're both working that really well in your poems. Um, I was struck too, I, I was thinking about the book, The Triggering Town by Richard Hugo, that, that you know, old Bible, right, that, that actually has so many interesting good tidbits in it but his idea of in every poem somebody has to be home um and you know he, he kind of hits on that and i think in your poems um you have a lot of people at home but there's always there is always somebody home there is somebody always there questioning and as you said michael kind of going up to the window and looking in um and i like that so they don't become that disembodied voice um um, be, because of that. So, okay, I, I think we probably only have time for one more question, if you will indulge me. So, um, during this tough time, um, could both of you just talk briefly about what you think we can do as, I don't know, as poets? How do we make, how does poetry make the world better? Um, it's got to try, <laughs> especially now. How can we as poets make the world better? and change that around if you want play with it but you know what i mean so i'll say if you're a right if you're a writer writing poet poetry then i mean it just depends like if you have if you don't have privilege privilege a lot of privilege, then just take care of yourself like just resist like don't die <laughs> don't die like do everything you can if you are a person with a lot of privilege or more privilege or privilege period use it use it for equity don't read the same shit you've been reading change your syllabus change your syllabus 
read like the things that you should already be doing. Now's your time. You got time. Do it. You know, I have a lot of privilege as a professor. You know, I have a lot of time. I have time to read anti-racist books. I have time to search out books. I have, you know, those privileges. I, I can use those. If if you're, and I'll say like, if how can you make the word world better as a reader? I mean, when you read the books you read, I would just say, read yourself through them, you know? Don't treat the book or someone else as some other thing mm -hmm. for you to play with or to kind of like be a voyeur about. See the book, see the person, and then ask yourself, and how do I, who am I now, you know, through these lenses? That's, that's I feel like that's the best thing like you can do as a reader right now. Good, thank you, Michael. Um, I feel like I don't have too much to add. Sarah said like what it's all about. Um, I don't, I mean, I, for myself, I've always, I've started to believe that like poetry and art has made me sort of um, not even, it's, it's made me think about who I am and, and how I move through the world. And so, I mean, if you're a poet, keep keep doing that. Honestly, I would say like, take a few days off of social media if you would like to, because like, that's just like, you know, keep, keep yourself, stay healthy, go for a walk if you can. Um, and, and yeah, um, look like, yeah, like kind of like um, change the syllabus around, but also just look into different artists and um, kind of stay in that creative realm because that to me, like not just my own, you know, process of writing, but just um, watching videos of other creatives talk and interviews and things like that has also like helped me think about who I am and how I move to the world. Yeah. Well, and I just want to add to that, that for me reading both of your books, um, you know, there's no doubt that you're both doing good in the world. And, and uh, you know, when I read your books, I see a reaching out toward other people and a kind of you know, a way of sort of inviting them in. And um, I don't know, I think I think that certainly is one way that your books, at least for me, um, uh, they're doing that. And uh, thank you, thank you so much for being with us in the Dolly Poetry Series. And um, I'm a fan of your work and um, look forward to having you here in St. Pete when you can come. And um, to the rest of you who've tuned in um, this evening, thank you so much for joining us. And um, we'll be back in a month, the second Thursday of every month. So look forward to seeing you then. Until then, please stay safe. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.